Thank you. It is wonderful to be back. We have a great evening ahead of us uh, exploring the connection between uh, music and the mind. It really does not get any better than this because there are so many fascinating questions. Richard has already mentioned some of them. What's going on in the brain when we make music and when we listen to music and what's happening in the rest of our bodies? Why is music so enjoyable, so powerful? And for people with certain cognitive impairments, why can music open up their lives in ways that words cannot? What happens in the brain when musicians improvise? And what does this say about uh, the larger nature of creativity itself? So we will talk about all of this and much more. We have a terrific panel and a very special treat for you. So let me introduce our speakers. Jamshed Barucha is president of the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art. He's a cognitive scientist who's published widely on the cognitive and neural roots of music. He's also a national leader in issues dealing with the challenges facing higher education, and he is a classically trained violinist. Charles Lim is a neuroscientist and surgeon at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. He's also a faculty member of the Peabody Conservatory of Music. His current research areas focus on the neural basis of musical improvisation and creativity, as well as the study of music perception in deaf people with cochlear implants. Conchetta Tomeno is the executive director and co-founder of the Institute for Music and Neurologic Function and senior vice president for music therapy at Center Light Health System. She's lectured on music therapy around the world. Her research colleagues have included Oliver Sacks, who dedicated his book Musicophilia to her. She also plays the trumpet. I don't know if you're picking up on a recurrent theme here. We don't just have scientists. We have scientists who can play music. Uh, and last but not least, Vijay Iyer is a jazz composer and pianist who has been described by Pitchfork as one of the best in the world at what he does. His recent honors include the quintuple crown in the Downbeat International Critics Poll, including Best Jazz Artist and Best Jazz Album, but that is not all. He also earned an interdisciplinary PhD in music perception and cognition from UC Berkeley with a particular interest in embodied cognition. Now, you've probably figured out what our surprise is for the evening because we have a pan piano over there. Vijay has very graciously agreed to perform two short pieces during our program and in fact we're going to start with one of them. So Vijay, take it away. Thank you all. <laughs> I guess I'm on the camera now. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm very interested in improvisation and rhythm, and uh, I wanted to do something that involves both of those things. Um, this is actually not a composition of mine. It's by John Coltrane. And if you've heard of him, then you know this song. And if you haven't, then that's OK. But know that it's a pre-existing work that gives rise to improvisative possibilities.
Wow, that was fantastic. Um, well, as Vijay is reclaiming his seat, uh, Charles, let me throw it to you. One of the questions is, what's going on in the brain while musicians play? What, what do you think was going on in Vijay's brain while he played that piece? Uh, first, let me say that I'd much rather listen to him play than talk. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I don't know how good, we, we were talking about this earlier, first of all, Right before we came on, Vijay mentioned that he felt like he was an amateur pianist who just fell into a music career. And um, listening to you play makes me realize why I didn't <laughs> <laughs> fall into a music career. Because there is, I think, uh, a certain uh, concentration abandoned. That Those kinds of things, I think, uh, exist in a lot of different capacities, a lot of different behaviors. Musical creativity is... I think unique in many ways, but probably uh, shares many commonalities to other forms of improvisation. So in my lab, I'm trying to understand the biological basis for, for creativity and for improvisation. And I have to say that it's kind of treacherous scientific ground because I don't want anyone to think that I'm under any illusions that you can take what happened just now and capture it in a mm -hmm. scientific experiment. I mean, you have to be really careful when you even propose that idea that somehow that could be subject to experimentation, or that it even should be. And so I don't make any of these assumptions, yet I'm still trying to understand it. The reason why I'm trying to understand it is because, maybe it's because I'm a physician and I, I actually see brains and I see the ear all the time, that I can't help but realize that there is a biology to everything we do musically, meaning that there's a physicality, an actual neurobiology at stake that is leading to all of these great things. And while it's comfortable as a listener, as an admirer, as an artist to want to say, well, let's not, let's not delve deeper. Let's not try to subject this amazing thing to the constraints of science. There's something missing, I think, if you don't try to search. And so I feel some sort of obligation to keep on trying to understand this process. Well, let, let, let me throw it to Jamshed for a moment. Uh, what, what do we know about what, is, what parts of the brain are activated when, when a musician performs? Oh dear, I mean, if, if, if I were to put you in an MRI machine and play music or play this, you would see a splash of activity in many parts of the brain. I mean, you would see, you know, the auditory cortex, which is Heschel's gyrus, you will see the cerebellum, because there's timing, you would see the motor cortex, you would see the prefrontal, I mean, you would see a lot of things. I, I think, uh, to follow up on Charles, there is, uh, I, I think you're asking a question that we can only scratch the surface uh, uh, of, in terms of specifically what goes on in the brain, is, is that like to, is that just well, because the technology is limited <laughs> s s right now, and we will develop technology later at some future date where we well, will be able to pinpoint it more? I'm, I'm sure at some time in the future we will learn a lot more. But let me just say something about the very question that's begged by uh, the question of of what happens in the brain with creativity is why do we have creativity in the first place? And, and that's a very, you can address that question theoretically in a cognitive way without necessarily knowing what's going on in the brain. Human beings are capable of creative, of creativity uh, in a number of domains, music being one. You can have creative chess moves, you can have uh, creativity in, in language and so on. And there are in common commonalities across those domains. One is that there's a structure uh, and there's a sort of a framework, if you like, and then there are all kinds of, uh, an infinite number of possibilities within that framework. And so you have what's, what Chomsky used to call a generative system, although I'm not saying it's necessarily like language, but it's, it's generative in the sense that it's productive. Uh, Vijay uh, was you know, taking a Coltrane uh, basic uh, structure, and because he has a structure and because he has procedures, many of them are so automatic within him, he's able to create a potentially infinite number of improvisations, of new creative sequences that in some sense uh, are subsumed by that, that structure. And let me just end by saying, so why would human beings have that? And that there's no uh, agreement on the answer to that question, but, but uh, my view is that uh, creative domains enable human beings to connect, to form groups that, that can uh, uh, synchronize each other emotionally in terms of synchronizing their brains and, and create a sense of group identity if they become familiar with the structures uh, that enable them to understand, if you like, 
all of these improvisations based on the structure. And so every culture has these structures, and people who are embedded in the culture can get it. They can get what the improvisation is all about. People outside the culture, if you're outside the Coltrane culture, you may not necessarily get it. And so creativity gives the human species the ability to to create group cohesion in an infinite uh, number of possible I, I want to come back to okay. the question of why music? How, mm. why, why did this evolve? But Vijay, let, let me throw it back to you. What were you thinking about when you were playing? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of a truism in, in the way this kind of music is taught, which isn't how I learned it, but the way it's often taught is that they tell you not that you you must not be thinking when you're playing. And I think that that's kind of an impoverished view of what thought is, because thought is something that's distributed through our, all of our actions and all, you know, I view cognition as an embodied process, as you uh, mentioned in, in talking about my thesis work. When you, when you say embodied, me, you're saying it's not just something that happens in the brain. We have to think about how the mind interacts <coughs> with the fingers, with yes. our bodies, reacting to the audience, all right. of that. Um, so there are aspects of um, bodily expertise in terms of responding and making choices and actions in real time. Uh, and then there's also the uh, situated aspect of it, which is that my expertise is useless sitting over here. You know, it matters that I'm sitting there at that instrument and not just anywhere. You know, so that 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 structural aspect of the environment matters and is productive also. Uh, in terms of what I am thinking, though, I mean, I deliberately chose a piece that had a pre-existing structure that is meant to be improvised through. And in fact, the way Coltrane, this is called Giant Steps, and Coltrane wrote it for himself as a kind of etude. You know, it was really, it involves a sort of unlikely set of harmonic progressions or harmonic leaps or steps. and. Uh, and so he wanted to see if he could create lines that made sense across those weird, those weird leaps, but also at a, quite a high velocity, <laughs> if you're familiar with the original. Uh, so then there's a degree of athletic um, rigor that's involved in just achieving it, merely achieving it, is itself um, that says something. You know, it's, it's, uh, and in fact, there's a famous uh, CD of outtakes of him. You know, he, when he first created this song, he tried recording it many, many times, about a hundred or so times, and there's a CD of just all a whole bunch of outtakes where you hear him trying and being dissatisfied, trying again, and, and there's a, a just a few seconds of banter at the beginning where he he's talking to his bandmates and he says, you know, I don't think I'm going to improve this. I mean, I'm I'm just trying to make the changes. I'm not telling no stories. <laughs> and then one of his bandmates said, well, really. If you make these changes, that'll tell them a story. Hmm. Mm. So I thought that was really interesting, that there's actually something to be said for putting yourself through a set of rigors or trials mm. and emerging somehow on the other side, having grown and developed a new kind of expertise. Well, I guess what, what, I'm, what I'm so fascinated by is I, I'm trying to figure out how much you're thinking this out as you're up there playing, or are your fingers leading? Where, where do you think it comes from? Well, there are a lot of micro decisions being made every step of the way. There are certain, um, how should I say it? I guess potentialities that, well, I, I've made a point actually when I work with this song in particular because the tendency when people try to play this song is to kind of outline the chords and play a lot of uh, arpeggios and things that sort of delineate, look, I'm playing the changes, you know. And for me, I wanted to work more with what's at hand that work. So what's actually right here, where my hand is, that is a solution, you know, one of many possible solutions. And really, if you start looking within a small compass of the range of the hand, you find very different pathways to the same material. So I'm often making choices like that that have to do more. So then you're kind of creating uh, very small melodies, melodic fragments that are, have a small compass that might have a sort of um, almost a folk-like character because they're so, uh, they have simple intervals in them. Hmm. So I, I guess I'm trying to think in those terms about just stringing together little fragments of melody. 
But I'm also, you know, I also set this song in a different rhythmic cycle than the original song, thinking about, <coughs> and when I say thinking about, I mean making myself do <laughs> the, uh, the rhythmic work, you know, because rhythm is not just uh, something you get right. It's something that is meant to be communicated or else it's not really working, hmm. you know, it's meant to be uh, something that's shared. Well, I want, I want to follow up on this idea of how music can take over our bodies in some way. And, and Connie, I want to bring you sure. into this because you, you're a music therapist. I mean, you, you, you have very, uh, up, for, up close, you, you have worked with people whose lives have been transformed by music. Sure. How do you explain that? I mean, it, it, t tell me about some of the kinds of people you've worked with. Well, you know, it's interesting because we're talking about mm -hmm thinking about doing, you know, how much we think when we, when we do music, the patients I work with usually can't think about how to do something again because of a brain injury. They can't think about how to walk if they have Parkinson's disease, or they can't think about how to initiate a movement or maybe how to speak because speech has been damaged through a stroke. But yet there's something about the music and the temporal structure of the music, the emotional content of the music that arouses these areas of the brain, I assume, that is still functioning, that allow that ability to come present, to become present as they're participating in the music. For example, um, the patients in Awakenings that Oliver Sacks wrote about were the patients we worked with, you know, um, and before the L-Dopa really took in, it was music and rhythm that allowed them to walk. So, so, so some of these are people who, who literally cannot speak. But right. but with music somehow that opens them up and, and the well, astonishing it, 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 speak, it speaks to the the, the structures that are shared huh. um, with music perception music ability and other types of brain function that um, that take over from from motor function and speech and aren't, aren't there stories about how people can actually sing musical lyrics even when they can't carry on a conversation sure yeah. well people who have a stroke and Broca's area a non fluent aphasia many times can sing a song perfectly, perfectly well, and that's because of a dominance on the right side of the brain, so if the broke is homolog of that ability. So, and many times, you know, in, in neurology, um, from the neurologists I spoke to, they of, often use that as a parlor trick where they'd have somebody who had aphasia and couldn't speak sing a song and say, look, you know, they could do that. Um, the challenge way back when was that it was just assumed that just because a person could sing they would never recover speech, that the brain has been damaged, there's no chance for plasticity and recovery. But yet over time we saw in our, in our clinic with our patients that indeed if they were using music and speech within the structure of music and song, that some of these elements of speech came back. And it really spoke to the fact that there must be shared processes that inform the brain through music. Well, let's bring the neuroscientists back in. What's the, what's the relationship between music and speech, music and language? Mm -hmm. Oh, there actually there are quite a few. I'll, I'll say a little bit, and I'm sure yeah. that yeah. others want to follow. But um, th there's phenomenal work by uh, Lerdahl and Jackendoff, which is sort of the uh, one of the s seminal works on the relationship between music and language, where they argue that there's a fundamental uh, relationship between the syllabic uh, structure of speech as we speak, the way our syllables are sequenced uh, according to their relative stress. So if I say we're in New York, you tend to say New York, where York is strong and New is weak. And so pairs of syllables in, a, in what's called a, a syllable in a stress-timed language has this kind of hierarchical structure where you can, you can take a syllable that's stronger and weaker and show which one, you know, have them as a sort of a branch of a tree. Uh, pairing up like that and then larger units and you find exactly the same kind of structure in music and you can find it in western music, you can find it in Indian music, you can find it in folk music, you can find it in most forms of music and so uh, there are some very very fundamental, fundamental primordial uh, aspects of brain organization that's not necessarily auditory it's more abstract than sound. Well is, isn't yes. there a big debate, I don't know if debate's the right word, but a big <coughs> question among those who study human evolution about which came first, music or language? Well, linguists think language 
came first, but we musicians know music. <laughs> yes. We know the right answer. <laughs> Before they were words. <laughs> Charles, what's your guess? You know, both, both language and music share so many parallels, but also have huge differences. And they're both complex auditory systems that are meant to convey meaning. The way I view um, the, there's the neurobiological aspect and there's the teleological aspect, which is that language has a very pragmatic function, and that function is to convey meaning with semantic precision, meaning a sentence has a particular definition that everyone has agreed upon a priori so that when I say those words, you know what I meant or what I intended. Music doesn't have any of that semantic precision. In fact, it's arguable that music has no real meaning at all. And so, uh, which is, I think is a pretty fascinating thing because yet we love it. And so, there, are, there are possible counterexamples. Right. I was going to say, depending <laughs> on where it you study, then. Does, any, does, yeah. does anyone want to jump in and, well, and uh, quibble with this that music has no meaning? Well, I think it can serve a communicative purpose. And, uh, uh, but I think what you said earlier about uh, its role as a synchronizing force in a collective experience. Uh, that says a lot because I think you know what rhythm does is it allows us to synchronize our actions. And rhythmic expertise allows us to do this, so we can actually, for example, hit a drum at the same time in the same rhythm repeatedly. And when two people do something, it's twice as loud as when one people one person does it, and that means it covers twice the area and reaches four times as many people. So then you know because of that, uh, that allows an instant gain in uh, communicative power because of that synchronizing ability. So I think, but I also, just to, in my own experience as, a, you know, playing for audiences, uh, that's the primary um, force that I, that I, I feel is uh, at work, is the, that sense that we're all in a room experiencing this together. And I think we tend to forget that because nowadays we stockpile music by the terabyte and keep it in our <laughs> shirt pocket or something and and uh, forget that it's actually something that until about a, you know a hundred years ago was something we did in the same space together so fr from the listeners perspective we've been talking mostly about people who perform music why are we so often compelled to tap our foot or you know uh, sort of bob our head as we're listening along what what is it that takes over in our bodies that is part of the musical experience. Well, music is, is embodied. I think Vijay is correct. And if you, as I said, if I put you in an MRI machine and you're told to lie completely still, as I'm sure everybody here has been, or most of you, uh, unfortunately, in such a machine, you can't move at all, you will actually see your motor cortex. If you listen <laughs> to music, you'll see your motor cortex active, even though you're not moving. So your brain is basically... Uh, uh, it, it is showing activity in areas of the cortex that drive movement mm -hmm. even though you're moving. And so you're yeah. actually actively trying to inhibit the music's tendency to make you move automatically. And, you know, uh, I'm a, I play Western classical music, but it's the only form of music I know where you're taught to sit absolutely yeah. still in an audience. <laughs> and it's very hard, you right. know, okay. because the, the, the brain is telling you move. And most cultures have structured ways of moving with the music, and music is related to dance, and that's related to the synchronization, because in mm -hmm. ancient societies and, and contemporary societies, uh, dancing is another form of synchronizing people to create a sense of group. Mm -hmm. so, so dance and music, from an evolutionary perspective, probably came up together? The, the, I mean, they, do, they coexist in every culture on Earth. I mean, that, that much we know. I don't know how much more data we need than that. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but I think also we have to remember what music is. I mean, we often, especially in this field, we have a tendency to speak of it as if it's something we come to rather than something that comes from us. I mean, music mm -hmm. is first and foremost the sounds of us doing stuff, right, with our bodies. And so when you hear music, you're hearing other bodies making Move, you're hearing other bodies moving, and that's the first, that's like sort of the baseline level of music perception as well. Somebody is doing something. I mean, again, it's easy to forget that because we have electronic music and we have iPods and so on, but it is somehow an auditory trace of human activity. That's what music is. And so I think there is that, the way I see it, there's what rhythmic uh, 
expression, it, what, uh, for example, a rhythmic response to, mu to music listening, like bodily motion, like dance, which is a, a refined or perhaps form of, of a more basic impulse, is some kind of sympathetic recognition of that, those, the, the stuff that makes music happen. I w do you know this uh, Mark Changizi's work about, um, he has a book called Harnessed that came out this year where he's talking about, um, uh, well, his, his claim is that music is really the sounds, is, is primarily this, it's the sounds of hu other humans doing stuff. And where our perceptual systems are attuned to code for these things, to hear uh, you know, and, and uh, pick out of the environment the sound of a body moving it, with the particular rhythms that it has. And uh, he, says, he makes a case that we're evolutionarily attuned to hear each other in our midst. And he says that, uh, he kind of makes the case that music is made of those kinds of sounds, of, of basically the rhythms of bodies in motion. So, so why is music pleasurable? What why does music have the power that it so often has? I mean, we, we kind of know this just from our personal experiences, but do we, do we know what's happening in the brain to explain that? Well, Satori and, and Blood did a, a study a while back that looked at, and it was interesting because they, they looked at music that gave people chills. And the music that they looked at was um, important to the individual person, but of course the five or ten musicians that they studied, each person had their own particular music that gave them the chills. And what they did for the study was to, uh, they used each other's music as a control. So <laughs> the piece of music that would make you excited or feel really good would make me feel good. And, and it's interesting because over, over a lifetime, of course, we start creating these responses to music that then become wired in but you're also suggesting that we have specific music memories. Right. And, and maybe that's and, and, a different kind of memory and, and, than and the when, other kinds of memories And when the people have, have the chills, uh, certain neurochemicals get released. So when you hear a piece of music that makes you feel good, there's actual chemical changes in your brain in that moment. Otherwise, you wouldn't have those feelings. So we, we develop those tastes and those responses, though, I believe, through experience over time. So um, music doesn't necessarily turn everybody on the same way. I mean, pleasure is a very limited criterion, uh, if you think <laughs> about it. Uh, we listen to very sad music. We listen to music that's very angry. We're, uh, so I think the notion that we listen to music just for pleasure or something to be pleasing is very limited. Yes, yeah. we do that a lot. Uh, but uh, if you're, for example, uh, if, you're, if, if somebody in your family is sad, we have this false... Uh, tendency to think, oh, let's play them something happy and we'll cheer them <laughs> up. Well, they're going to say, stop it. I don't want to listen to that. I want to listen to something sad. And, and they're going to resonate to sad music if they're sad. And they're going to resonate to happy music if they're happy. And so there's the, the notion of resonance or synchronization right. is much more important than somehow sort of making you happy or lifting up your yeah. spirits. And that, that's, that's important because, you know, in the field of music therapy, there's a, a term called the ISO principle, where you really meet the patient where they're at at that moment. And the only way music could really be effective is to really be able to touch them where they're feeling or how they're feeling in that moment, to be able to allow them to release either emotionally or physically something that's been blocked otherwise. Well, it also sounds like you're saying that perhaps we haven't really developed a vocabulary to talk about emotion in music. I mean, the experience that we have is so much bigger and more complicated sure. than, than the language that we have for it. Charles, your sense? You know, I think it's important to point out here that there's a certain primitive neurobiology at play, meaning mm -hmm. that a lot of these reward systems or aversion systems that we have they are basic biology, yeah, things that motivate fear, hunger, thirst, mm -hmm. all these senses that really primitive survival instincts, mm -hmm. these are the things that can get stimulated by music. And it's a pretty interesting idea, especially when you think that music is really old. Okay? It's, <laughs> and it's existed in every, I mean, every historical epoch that's ever been studied. I mean, 50,000 years ago, humans were making primitive musical instruments. I mean, 50,000 years ago, <laughs> out of bones of animals. It's a very peculiar behavior, especially when you're trying to survive. And so there's, I think, a very close linkage between 
to me what is really the wonder of music, which is that this abstract acoustic vibration in the air leads to a deep emotional response. And to me, that's a remarkable process. And um, I mean, the feeling of it is so overwhelming. To try to study it scientifically is very daunting. I think also, just to touch back on the language and um, music comments that we were making, I hope I, I know the neurobiology of this may be unclear. I, I hope everybody recognizes that the, the brain has a very clear anatomic structure, and we know for the most part what these things do, loosely speaking. But as we study these topics more, we're realizing that our models were a little too simplistic. Yeah. It's not that there's a music part of the brain. Right? There are parts of the brain that process complex sound, parts of the brain that right. process syntactic components of language and music, parts of the brain that process meaning, parts of the brain that process emotion, and they're all coordinated by this kind of executive frontal machinery. That is why I think music and language have so many of us, because they actually share some so many, similar yeah. neural architecture. I mean, the same neurons are involved in some of these language operations and these musical operations. It's just that the language studies came first. And so our first understanding of Broca's area was in a language capacity or a stroke that led to a language deficit that led to it being ascribed a language function. We know now that when two musicians play music back and forth and trading fours in a jazz gig, they're using Broca's area That's of the brain. Right. No words are spoken. But I have to ask you about something that follows up on a, an interview I did with Oliver Sacks. Who, he, he told me something that I found astonishing, which is that if you look at the, uh, the brain image of a professional musician, you could usually spot that it's a musician, whereas you can't see that in a mathematician or a visual artist. There's something that happens in musicians, I mean, who've, who've been playing their whole lives, that has rewired their brains. It, is that true, do you think? Uh, I'm not sure which data he's actually talking about. There are, so for example, at musicians, there's structural and functional anatomy that you have to think about differently. So the brains of musicians clearly function differently than the brains of non-musicians. So if you actually look at functional patterns of activation, meaning you take VJ, you scan his brain while he's listening to something, and then you take somebody who's never played jazz piano, have them listen to something, the brain activation functional patterns are totally different. The anatomy, the basic core anatomy, meaning gross anatomy, when you look at the contour of the brain, the shape of the, so the salsa and the gyre, those things are relatively consistent. In people that have perfect pitch, though, for example, the uh, primary auditory cortex seems to be actually compact in size, at least in the right hemisphere, for perfect pitch musicians. That's an example of a structural change induced by music or chicken or the egg kind of question. <laughs> right, right. Or you had that ability and that led you to go into music. And so there are anatomical or morphological differences, but I think overall, by and large, the real differences are not, they're functional more than they are morphological. Mm -hmm. Well, I have to ask, I, I can't let you go without asking about the so-called Mozart effect. You know, the idea that you know, we should all play music to our kids, maybe even when they're still in the womb, because they're going to become smarter. Is there any science behind this? Do you, you know Fran Rausch's work. Um, <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. That was a, a really good marketing campaign um, for uh, a, a research article that came out about, that was really about attention and, arous and I think, stimulation. Um, and because of that one, one study, there was this generalization that, that listening to Mozart would make you interesting. I think some of the uh, subsequent studies that came out was more about um, stimulating or priming the brain for attention when you listen to certain types of music and that priming allows the person to be more attentive to task mm -hmm. when something's happening. And well, so that a, may be the role that music plays is to, you know, get somebody ready to learn to arouse the right I, part I, of the brain. Yeah, I, I, I think in the original study it wasn't about certain types of music. It was really Just one only piece of the two one yeah, the two piano right. concerto yeah, yeah. Mozart concerto. So this was, and the control experiment, the control case was silence or yeah, something. Yeah. Yeah. It was so a it was deeply flawed experiment. And the, yeah, the marketing, uh, it was extraordinary. It's one of these things that went straight yep. from the lab to the front pages of the newspapers, That's bypassing right. their science editors, <laughs> right. I'm sure, and, <laughs> and reviewers. And, and it was scientists too. It's not it's like specific <laughs> to Mozart at all, right. and, uh, yeah. at all. Yeah. Now, uh, they, some years back, I was editing this journal called Music Perception, mm -hmm. and um, the Mozart effect was, there was a lot of hype about that, and then somebody sent in a paper saying, I found the same thing for Schubert, so <laughs> maybe we should call it the Schubert-Mozart effect. 
And no then, one tried Ellington or pardon? Yeah. no one tried Ellington or yeah. Hendrix or I'm, I think people Hogan. have tried everything. <laughs> yeah. And then somebody tried just listening to stories. Yeah. And they found a similar thing. Yeah. Now, of course, these are the only the people who people who found something. There are a lot of people who've tried to replicate who haven't found anything at all. Now, I think there is something going on. If you look at it under what's called a meta, uh, do the meta analysis. If you look at all the hundreds of studies that have been done, uh, not all of them replicate, but there are enough replications that something is going on. But it looks like it's more exactly what was mentioned, something about attention, or some have suggested it may be a, a mood manipulation. I mean, as Vijay said, the control condition in the original experiment was sitting in a room in silence for 10 minutes, right? If you happen to be in that condition, if you were randomly picked for the Mozart condition, you listen to Mozart for 10 minutes. Well, if you were sitting in a tiny little cubicle at some psychology department somewhere for 10 minutes, and then you had to take an IQ test, you may not be in a very good mood. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I want to come back to the question of creativity, which we started with. And, and Charles, you've done some really remarkable studies by putting jazz musicians inside your fMRI machines. How you do that, I don't know. Uh, yeah, how, how, how does someone play in, in one of those machines? It's slightly awkward. Um, <laughs> I mean, so uh, for those of you that have been in a regular MRI, a functional MRI is not really any different ergonomically, meaning it's a really tight space. It kind of feels like a coffin in a way. Um, you're, you're lying down on your back. You've got two mirrors that are enabling you to see your hands the right side up. So mirror, mirror, pointing down at a piano keyboard that is about this long that sits on your lap and your legs are propped up. Then you've got electrostatic headphones so you can hear the output. So the, the piano sends a uh, digital signal out to the, a computer that's outside that then sends a piano note back to your headphones that corresponds to the note that you played. It's not an acoustic instrument. And it actually works pretty well. I mean, I've been in there for hours myself just trying to get this thing to work. <laughs> and um, you can just kind of play. And so, yeah, it, it's, it's doable. So yes. one of the things you've been studying is what happens in the brain when, particularly when jazz musicians improvise. Right. And I know you've studied both when they do it solo and also when they've been playing with other musicians. Yes. What have so you found? I'm looking at several different spontaneous improvisation conditions, including visual artists drawing to, mm -hmm. and to understand, and rappers rapping, try to understand what happens in these moments of spontaneous improvisation. And it's Suffice to say, it's really complicated, but the one defining trait I think that is always present in some form or another is some degree of prefrontal inhibition. Mm -hmm. okay. I see this over and over again, that there's big portions or important portions of the prefrontal cortex that are relatively turning off during this improvisation behavior. And you know, this, again, I think speaks to, this, to Vijay's comment that it's the way we're conceiving of thought. Okay? That doesn't mean that you're turning your brain off. Mm -hmm. It means that you are putting certain processes that are normally at the forefront into the, for, into the background. What, what, what are you uh, trying to shut so down? So, for example, though? conscious self-monitoring, okay? effortful processing, um, let's just say, paying enormous attention to the detail of what you are doing and concerns that you want to make sure that your response is correct or appropriate. So you've got to shut down that critical voice that might prevent you from that's doing right. something new. That, that's sort of the kind of qualitative musical explanation that you, in order to generate a new idea or to play something with abandon, you have to have a certain lack of concern about whether you're right, hmm. okay, whether you're correct, whether it sounds good. I mean, you have to be true, I think, to this some sort of I mean, I think this is what makes a great jazz musician great, is that they can do that. So, Vijay, does well, that resonate with you? Uh, I don't know what makes anyone great, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, will, I want to ask you this, though, because this is actually, you know, I've been following your work for a long time, and it's very exciting. But uh, my, the way I think of improvisation is that it's almost everything that we do anyway. Mm -hmm. So where do you, um, you know, so you're using these, very specific and focused examples of improvisation. But to me, your control, and when your control is like somebody who's regurgitating something they memorize, that to me is an extreme and, and unlikely situation. So to me, the control is more the experiment and the, you know, like the improvisation <laughs> is more, it's sort of like, it's the background noise of everything we do. I mean, it's how we learn to do everything. It's how we become how we learn how to talk mm -hmm. and how we learn how to walk and do ev eat and do everything. So we tend to think of improvisation, especially in the West, as some sort of extreme occasion. 
but really, it's sort of this banal thing that we are always doing, including right now. You're, so. you're, you're shattering my illusions of what creativity <laughs> is all about here. And I mean, I, I, I want to push on this for a moment because, I mean, really, one of the one of the questions here is, you know, for those people who are truly creative, and let's just focus on music for a moment, uh, what's what's going on with them? What makes them different? What what? I mean, can we talk at all about creative genius in, in terms of what's happening in the brain? I think it's really important to point out that improvisation as a process takes place at low levels, mundane levels, and at high levels and profound mm -hmm. levels. That's the and they may be related, but they also may be different, mm -hmm. especially in the fact that the people that can do the profound levels of, of improvisation have a skill set that most people don't have. They've trained for years to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. That means that their brains are different and that their entire functional apparatus is really different. Mm -hmm. And so I agree completely that, and this is why I think improvisation matters, you know, this whole question of why creativity. I think, yes, communication, but for me, I don't see how human society would have survived. I think we would have all died right. if we weren't creative. We wouldn't have been able to solve a problem. We would still be stuck trying to figure out how to get something to roll. <laughs> and, and so I, I feel like we need creativity to be innovative, to problem solve, to see things laterally that we didn't see before. And it's this way of putting combinations of things together and coming up with something new that to me is a very fundamental facet of human society. That's but, why but, that, but that doesn't necessarily explain artistic creativity. Correct. But I think that maybe artistic creativity is a way to tap into the window of this process that happens when we talk about geniuses. If we want to understand genius, well, we need to start looking at some geniuses. And so that's why I've taken expert musicians. I mean, I'm stacking the deck. I'm only looking at experts to see what they do. And they are very naturally going into this state of mind when they are doing their musical activities. Now, that's not to say that a child doodling on a piece of paper isn't being creative. Mm -hmm. But I mm -hmm. suspect it's a different form of creativity, at least in terms of the, the, the degree, rapidity with which they can enter a certain mind state. Mm. And I think there's also a reason why amateur pianists or jazz musicians struggle with improvisation. Partly it's the way we're educated, mm -hmm. partly the musical systems we grow up in, but I think that there are many musicians in the classical domain that can't improvise at all. Yeah, and I'm so, one of them. Actually, no, I mean, I'll, in this sense, that my first instrument was the violin, and I'd had 15 years of violin lessons. And in the meantime, while that was happening, I started doodling on the piano, on my sister's piano. She was taking piano lessons, and so I actually learned to play the piano by improvising, whereas my violin training was basically teaching me how not to improvise, right. how and how never to improvise, you know, like right. really yeah. kind of stamping that tendency out of you as a... Yeah. As a, uh, that's kind of part of what it means to acquire that skill or that uh, expertise is to, um, I mean, there are, there are choices you make at the interpretive level that are very real time and can feel very in the moment, Creative. you know, yeah. that, and that's perhaps some aspect of what mm -hmm. we're calling improvisation, but, um, but in terms of generating material on the violin, I'm kind of paralyzed. So. You know, you talked about genius. I think, uh, the concept of genius is overly mythologized. And I think most people in cognitive science and neuroscience would believe that. We, we have this uh, tendency to say, uh, express awe. Oh, he's a genius. It's, it's that some kind of different plane. But I think the, the view, scientific view, is it's not a qualitative difference. It's a quantitative difference <coughs> and of, of extreme. And that uh, there are some necessary conditions there, which, which uh, Charles alluded to. There are no uh, examples of that kind of level of performance, uh, whether it's creative performance or just simply executing uh, on, on an instrument, that aren't predicated on years and years of intense training. And so, uh, you know, there used to be this notion that somehow you just, you know, just born, and then you, were, maybe, you know, <laughs> Mozart just wrote his symphonies. He didn't. Uh, whether you're talking about Bobby Fischer or you know the Mozarts or whatever it is, uh, there are no examples uh, that haven't involved very, very intense years of training, um, and 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 that is what makes some of these processes, as Vijay says, uh, automatic. So you don't have to start thinking mm -hmm. about them. You, it, 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 the, the brain has the ability to transfer conscious or controlled processes into automatic processes through a lot of practice. 
Now, there is a movement in some <coughs> circles in neuroscience to try to come up with what's been called a neuroaesthetics. And there are some very well-known neuroscientists like V.S. Ramachandran, <coughs> Eric Kandel, who've kind of signed on, who've sort of said, you know, there are aesthetic categories that are kind of embedded in, in our brains. And if we can just sort of figure this out, we can kind of come up with a science of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So my question to all of you is, can aesthetics, can beauty really be explained by science? <laughs> <laughs> I think, <laughs> please Again, go ahead, John. <laughs> Maybe it's in how you frame the question. I don't know that explain is what you do to beauty. <laughs> I, I think you, you appreciate, you recognize it, and then you figure out why we recognize beauty, why we care about beauty. To me, that is understanding beauty. That's not trying to demystify it or make it less spectacular than it is. But I think it's clear, it's not unreasonable to suggest that when we see something beautiful and it affects us, that our brains are doing that. Right? It's not, it's, it, there is, neuronal activity that's leading to that. There's a neurologic function at stake that's sensory processing, analyzing output, emotional responses. If we didn't have a brain, we wouldn't be feeling that that is you know, a beautiful thing. And so I think that while we want to be very respectful when we approach something like art, we also want to be, I think, realistic and not just con constantly shy away from understanding it better. And so the way I always feel about these kinds of projects is that we can understand them better than we currently do. We may never get to the end, but we can keep asking. Now we, have, we, we could go on and on about this, but I want to bring in the audience here. But before we do this, so let me just mention a couple of things. There will be two roving mics. So if you have questions, uh, just get ready, and the, someone with a microphone will come and find you. But meanwhile, Vijay will play, I hope, one okay. more piece for us. And then when he's done, we will go to, uh, to, the, to the audience, to you. Uh, this is a this is something I created in memory of my grandparents. It's called Remembrance.
who wants to take this on? How, how did we remember all this? Well, uh, it, clearly it does fit uh, in our brains. <laughs> and it's just that we are still a long ways off before we can understand uh, how all of that information is encoded. I mean, there are theories, there are these models uh, that, of how networks of neurons interconnect by changing the strength of the synapse that connect them. And if you, if you think about the number of neurons there are and the number of synaptic connections, you're getting into some very, very, very large numbers. And there are some actually, there are actually it's a mathematical theorem. You, you, can, you can show that for orthogonal patterns, they can be encoded in the same uh, in neural network uh, you know, without interference. And so it's not as if you need a separate chip or a separate memory register for each new memory. Uh, there's, there, is, there are very clever ways that evolution has found to use the ensemble of, of neurons interconnected in certain ways to, uh, to store multiple memories that are triggered by appropriate contexts. And so within the same circuit, a certain queue will result in one state, which is the recovery of the memory, and another queue will result in another state, which is the recovery of another memory. And so when you start thinking about it that way, you get tremendously uh, large combinatorics uh, that all fit into our skull. Having said that, it wouldn't surprise me in 50 years, 100 years, you know, people will discover some other uh, neuroscientific phenomena that uh, also are involved in memory that we don't know about today. Well, l let me follow up, Vijay, with you. Uh, do you find that you can keep memorizing new pieces or to make space for those new pieces? Do you have to forget <laughs> other things? I have to say I felt differently before I became a parent. But <laughs> uh, there was a time when I thought memory was infinite, and now I'm quite aware that it isn't. <laughs> uh, but I do, you know, much of what happens in, uh, certainly in improvisational music is that you have generative processes, you know, so it can take very little um, structural information to enable a whole, you know, a whole night of music, really, actually. Like you can, I mean, it's sort of like, um, I mean, MIDI data, you know, for example, like the, the, the kind of machine he uses to play in the machine, in the F fMRI is a keyboard that sends out like eight bits of data, right? I mean, it's very low res kinds of control data. So it's, I kind of see like, the co compositional form, especially with an imp improvisation, is sort of like control data that is very low re low resolution, but it actually enables a lot of things to happen, you know. And the other thing I would say is that in this particular case of this piece, I really do think about my grandparents. Like, it, I try to reach, before I play anything, I try to really reach that state of remembering them, and so that because I'm interested in kind of seeing if part of the composition, in this case, can be inducing that very particular, and quite, you know, I, I knew them fairly well, so, you know, when I think about them, I think about a lot of things. But it's really, you know, I, I wanted to see if, can, can this become a compositional element, that me making me, myself, think about somebody, you know, and, and what does that bring out? What does that elicit? And maybe each, in, each instantiation of it will be different somehow because of that. Yeah, I'd be happy to come in. I think, um, first of all, what you're pointing out is, is correct. And I think it's part of the dangers in trying to make a very complicated story represented by your two or three sentences. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when we talk about something like the prefrontal cortex of the brain, this is an immense area of the brain, okay? It does many, many, many things. I, I like to say it's not the jazz area of the brain, okay? <laughs> I mean, it's involved in so many different processes that range from things like working memory and uh, conscious, uh, conscious monitoring, effortful stepwise planning. I mean, all of these things that 
I mean, if you had to list the number of functions that this part of the brain did, you would never finish. I mean, you would just keep going. And so there's a, I think the problem that neuroscientists face, especially in functional imaging, is that we need to explain our findings. Okay? And it's, it's a problem because we observe something. That observation is fairly simple, less blood flow to this part of the brain. <laughs> Yet there's this whole context where we have to say, okay, what does this mean? And that interpretation, that interpretive aspect of neuroscience is problematic. I think too much emphasis is actually placed on it because we don't really know what it means. That's why it's called a discussion when you read about it. <laughs> um, the, but that part of the paper, I think, needs to be taken with a, a lot of, lots of grains of salt because what we're really saying is that the known range of functions includes these things, and a possible explanation for this finding might be that during a jazz solo, you are relatively disinhibiting certain areas of the brain so that you might promote certain other synaptic networks from firing. That, I think, is reasonable. But I think that I don't want you to have the impression that what I'm saying is, OK, let's turn this off, let's turn this on, you know, let's, let's have no memory, let's forget that we're playing the instrument. There's all of these complex things that are hardwired in an expert musician, music theory, knowledge of the mm -hmm. instrument, that that may be part of why an expert can do this better than an amateur, because things like theory playing the actual notes on the, on the keyboard, hearing not just the conception of the idea, but the execution of the idea become much harder when you're an amateur. And so I, I don't want you to take a too binary view of what I said when I discussed the prefrontal cortex. It's really pretty complicated. There's also medial prefrontal cortex activity that goes up during certain solo jazz improvisations, which makes sense when we think about that area of this default network of the brain being evoked by musical memories. And so it's this kind of autobiographical, self-reflective part of the brain that turns on during improvisations, which might be part of why you have your own musical sound or your own voice when you're improvising. So thank you for the question. You, you know, it's interesting because there's um, the whole area of, of auditory perception and rhythmic perception. You know, I'm, I'm curious from the scientists, you know, what that means because um, there's a whole, there's a test for people uh, who have amusia, you know, who have the inability to hear or process certain aspects of sound. And it could be that your perception of rhythm is somehow skewed. But he, you can't the, feel on, it. So on the, the other hand, what, he, what he's saying is that he enjoys music, he enjoys music even though despite he, the fact that he can't produce it. Yes. So you, you can't physically clap to music, but you can obviously hear the rhythm of music, otherwise you wouldn't be able to appreciate. So it, it talks about the, the separate of separation of that function, too, from mode of execution. But, but let's be perception. fair, we, we don't know how good his perception is either, yeah. right? I mean, <laughs> well, honestly, but he enjoy, I mean, so, but, but it, you, it speaks to enjoyment. But, you know, you can be legally blind and still enjoy looking That's at a right. painting, right? You're, you're not seeing the painting the way somebody with perfect vision is, yet you're enjoying right, it. Right. Same, same thing can happen in music. I mean, cochlear implant patients, I have many that love music. I love it. Maybe they love it because they were deaf their whole life. But when I actually test them, they can't tell an octave apart. Just what I would add, though, is that rhythm is something you can train yourself into and acculturate yourself to. And, and I think, you know, you see in different cultures different kinds of <laughs> rhythmic expertise that one, you know, that, like, rhythmic expertise that might work in James Brown's band might not work when you're playing Dvorak's Second Symphony. I don't know. I mean, there's been some yeah, studies about, about um, even babies responding to continent and dissonant music and how much attention they, how much time they attend to a, a continent interval compared to a dissonant interval and how they'll get distracted by the dissonance or turn away from it. So there, there's a, a sort of wiring, I would think, that has some, something to do with continents and dissonance. But um, exposure to music, obviously, you know, over time, you could create an incredible like for dissonant music, again, through training and exposure. So the well, consonants and happens. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Consonants and dissonance is one of those topics that uh, I think we will continue to uh, understand more and more without ever understanding it completely. Yeah. It's the kind of topic where you think uh, it's simple and you grab onto it, but there's a lot more. Uh, there are purely acoustic determinants of consonants and dissonance that have to do with the harmonic nature of periodically vibrating objects. But then there are uh, clearly cultural aspects of consonant and, and dissonance. There's, there's no question about it. And 
you know, we've demonstrated that in some studies uh, where the brain, uh, as a result of being in a culture, uh, it learns certain patterns so that then when you hear only fragments of that pattern, the brain actually leads you to expect the missing pieces. It fills it in. And, and that's, the, that's really what a culture is, 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 is your brain is so used to these structures that you only need fragments, and then it sticks the rest of, its, of that stuff in as expectations or anticipations, or even you think you actually heard something that you didn't hear. And um, uh, if you are not familiar with that culture, then uh, a note that doesn't belong uh, will sound dissonant. If you're familiar with the culture, it will sound consonant. So there are cultural determinants as well. I have started to wonder if our tendency to treat music as a separate thing from other forms of behavior has reduced our understanding of it. Because there are a lot of proto-musical behaviors we have in everyday life, whether it's, you know, you know doing this or something, you know, or, uh, uh, you know, um, I mean, I'll with my I'll bring up parenthood again, but with my daughter, I'll easily just sort of sing a sentence here instead of saying it to her. And these kind of things that, uh, or just even speaking in a more rhythmic way or something. Um, and there are also plenty of forms of music that some people will not call music. So I think the, the word music ends up creating separation yeah. between um, what may at one point have been very connected forms of behavior. I think that's right, and I think that that's a result of the <coughs> development of so-called high culture, uh, where certain art forms become extremely elaborated and require high levels of expertise and training. And then we put people on a stage and we say, that's the musician, and mm -hmm. that's music. And the culture does lose uh, what you say, uh, which is that in traditional cultures, music is part of the fabric of everything people do. It's not as if you're a musician and you're not a musician. Everybody's singing, everybody's dancing, mm -hmm. and, and some might be better than others, but you haven't become specialized. So we have lost something. There's no question about it. The techniques that we use are really very crude. Right? And so functional MRI, just use this for starters, it's a vascular method. It's a hemodynamic method. It's not an electrical method. Okay? So we're not actually studying neurons. We're mm -hmm. studying blood flow. But that also means that we don't really know which neurons we're studying. <laughs> and so we could be studying glia, just not know it. Okay? And so I think what we're seeing is that fMRI, we, we have to take, and look, it's the best method we have for certain experiments. And we have to know that it tells us information that we couldn't get before, yet we can't take it to the next logical step. Now, this is where I think experiments in humans are also limited, because you just can't do single unit physiological recordings of neurons in an awake human safely. Right? And so I certainly can't get volunteers for it. And so <laughs> I think that we have to be quite realistic about what we're going to know, really know, in a, in when a human listens to music. And so I think the question you're asking is a good one, but we're probably, I think, many years away from actually really answering your question. As far as the cerebellum, it's highly musical. I'll tell you this much. If you hear this, without moving, you're, you're going to have cerebellar activity. And if I make that slightly less regular, that activity is going to go up. And if I make it even less regular, a little, it's going to go up again. It implies that our cerebellum is really hardwired to, efficiently hardwired to, tr to train to regular intervals. And when patterns deviate from that, we start calculating that automatically, even though we're not moving. And so I think the cerebellum plays a huge role and probably underappreciated role in music perception because we tend to think of it as a motor coordination structure. But it's probably very important in a lot of sensory processing that precedes those motor outputs. I can only speak to the resiliency of, of music and emotion in patients who um, have lost the ability to understand what they're going through. And so one of, the, one of the reasons why we think that music affects, for example, people with Alzheimer's disease is that the emotional connections to music are so strong and so basic 
that it's able to be stimulated even when they can't consciously process what they're listening to. But that's from a clinical point of view. I'll let the scientists talk. Uh, I'm not going to give a very scientific an yeah. answer here. Um, that's quite a last question to try to answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, I have to say that I'm very skeptical or cautious when I start thinking about the parallels between animal life and human life, particularly when we start talking about emotion, because as a human, I'm biologically biased to think in human terms, and I'm trying to apply these constructs in a kind of you know, a pseudo anthropomorphistic way to try to understand what an animal's feeling. You know, as far as we know, no animals have really been able to report what they're feeling. And so I, I'm very cautious when I start thinking about this concept that musical, say, take bird song, was linked to a bird's feeling about something. That's not to say that it didn't serve a very primal biological instinct that they needed to do. But I think in much the same way that a flower might not care that it's pretty, we care. Uh, you know, a, a bird might not care that its song is beautiful. They care that the, that the song is correct. And so I tend to be a little skeptical because I don't know how we can prove these things. I'm not saying that there might not be a basis to it because somewhere our brains, if you look at the brain of, a, of an animal and you look at the brain of a human, it, there's a lot of similarities. In fact, probably a lot more similarities than differences. It's a little spooky. So I think emotion is one aspect of musical communication. I don't think it's the only one. I think... Uh, there was a time when people would say, music is the language of the emotions. I do not think that's true. I think music is, I mean, we all know music can express emotions extremely powerfully. But there are, uh, music uh, uh, communicates movement as well. And it's not necessarily emotional. But it, uh, but it enables people to synchronize their movements and create a sense of a, of a very powerful sense of, of being a, a, a group essentially a group uh, consciousness. Is that an emotion? I don't think so. But I think it goes further. I think even people uh, 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 say knowledgeable or e experience in a particular music culture, culture or subculture, simply paying attention to certain kinds of complex patterns that they might recognize uh, are synchronized in some way. And uh, they aren't necessarily f feeling an emotion and they aren't necessarily dancing together, and yet they are, in some sense, sharing the experience. So I think there are many aspects, there are many ways in which music can actually communicate by virtue of synchronizing people's brains. We are out of time. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, and there is a reception now. <laughs>